Now we look at the last sequential logic storage device, which is called the D flip-flop. And it's taken a set of interim steps to move from the cross-coupled inverter pair to the SR latch. And remember, the SR latch, we created that so that these, the cross-coupled feedback loop had inputs. We made an S-bar, R-bar latch so that we could have the opposite polarity on the latch depending on whether you set or reset. Then we made the SR latch with enable, which introduced a new signal, which was called C or clock. And that was uh, a way to have one signal tell the latch whether to store or operate as normal. And the reason we had to have the S bar R bar latches because the enable circuitry uh, would invert S and R. So then we had to have this latch operate with opposite polarities on the input. Then we limited the S and the R to be opposite to each other by, by putting an inverter in the S R latch with an enable to form the D latch. So then we finally are at a situation where we can create a D flip flop using two D latches. So let's take a look at how a D flip-flop operates. So this is the circuit of a D flip-flop. We are going to take two D latches. We're going to take two D latches and we are going to we are going to put them together and we're going to have data and we're going to have clock. Okay? And we're going to put inverters on the clock and we do that to set the polarity of the sensitivity of the whole D flip-flop. Now, you notice the symbol has changed. We have D and Q and Q bar, which were normal. D stands for data. However, we now have this new thing. We stop calling it the clock and we draw this little kind of greater than sign right here. And what this means right here is rising edge trigger. So the whole point of a D flip-flop is that it is going to activate or store on an edge. It's not going to store on a value like the D latch did. We're going to put two of them together and we're going to be able to have a very precise timing event, which is the rising edge of the clock, that will tell this to store the information. At all other times, Q will simply hold its last value. Q will not track data. It will just simply hold its last value until it sees the next edge. This is called a master-slave configuration because the D latches are always going to be in a complementary state. So you're going to have a state where one of them is in track, one of them is, is in hold. So the one that's tracking and the one that's holding, they're always op opposite of each other. And that's because when we feed the clock line in, we go through in an we go through, you can ignore that inverter, you're going to take one version of clock, put it here, you're going to take the opposite version and put it here. So that's what sets that one's in track and one is in hold. And we do an inverter on here so that the first one, if clock is a zero, then C is a one right here and that'll be in the uh, track mode and then this one will be in hold mode. Okay. So the way that this works is due to the way that the timing through this device works, you can think about it as one is opening, one is closing, one is opening, one is closing. And just the way that the signal propagates through, it will only be sensitive or it will only update the output on the a rising edge. Now you can create falling edge flip-flops if you wanted to. You could get rid of this inverter and make it a falling edge triggered, but this is a rising edge triggered flip-flop. So let's look at a timing diagram of this. <coughs> And let's first look at, let's look at just the inputs. You have clock and you have data. And what you typically do when you draw the clock now is you're going to draw a little arrow on it. And that indicates that's the triggering event. So data comes along and does whatever it's going to do. So you're going to come along and these lines right here indicate the edges of the clock. So data came over, went up, and then went down, then went up, down, up, and it stayed like that. What is going to happen with the output? Well, if you jump to the output, so let's just say that we covered up the interim states here, what would happen is that you would only latch Q, you'd only latch into Q when you had a rising edge. So you would latch here, data was a zero, so Q is a zero. Then no matter what data did, you didn't care, you only cared when you latched again. So you would have this event right here, and that would be where you latched in a one, which happened to be it, and then that would be it. So Q, data was moving all over the place, but Q was only updated on the rising edges of the clock. If you look and see how that changes, where 
we're going to look at the details of the of the D-latch. Let's get the D-latches on the screen. Let's take a look at what happens. So let's call C1 the input to the clock input of the D-latch, the first D-latch, and then we'll call C2 the input to the clock to the second D-latch. And what we can do is we can plot out what that, in, that signal is. So C1 is going to be the opposite of clock because it goes through an inverter. So notice this is clock and C1 is always the inversion of it. Then C2 is going to be the inversion of that, inversion of C1, or said another way, the equal, same as clock except just delayed a little bit. And then what's going to happen is these are always going to be track and hold, track and hold, track and hold. And you can define the interim signal, D1, as the signal between them and see what happens. So let's start off with the first timing event. So let's just isolate right here. We're going to have the clock to the system is low. That puts C1, I put C1, I'll put the, the circuit on there too, C1 into track and C2 into hold. So C2 is, is holding the last value of Q. It's ignoring what's happening on, on D1. So it doesn't care, it's just holding. However, C1 is tracking what's going on with data. In this situation, data didn't move, it just stayed at a zero. So what we can say is that D, D1 just tracked data. Okay, now let's go into the second mode. And in reality, we did have a latching event. So when we moved and put this device, we put the second D latch into its track state, well, this D latch right here went into the hold state. So for a brief moment, whatever D was, it, it was, it's updating and tracking data. For a brief moment, right before you put this into track, this thing, or this, this node right here, D1, was tracking what data was, okay? So it's tracking what data, it didn't move. And then what happened is that you put that into hold mode and all of a sudden D1 was locked in. Now D1 is locked, well look at what happens to the second D latch. It goes into track mode, it's going to track what D1 was. Well D1 is being held, so Q is equal to D1 and you got it. So that's how you were able to get it. Okay? So that's why one's open, one's closed. So in the beginning, this right here, let's go back to here, you had the second D latch holding the value, so it was just sitting at, at its hold track or its hold mode, and D1 right here was moving. It was it was tracking whatever data was because this D latch right here was in track mode. Then you said, okay, I'm going to now hold. So this goes into hold. So you asserted that input clock, and all of a sudden it said, grab it. So it grabbed whatever was on data at the time. In this situation, it was a zero. Held it right here on D1, and then this second D latch went into track mode and it passes it along and it'll hold it there. Okay? So now let's look at what happens here. So now we go through this state right here. Or we're into this state right here where the first one is in hold. It's ignoring the input. So data is doing this. It goes up and down. But the first D latch doesn't care. It's in hold mode. The second D latch is in track mode. It's just producing the output. Fine. The so data is, is ignored. Now we go back and we go into we're going to put this back into track mode and this into hold mode. Well, here's what ends up happening. The, this second D latch goes from track into hold mode, but just due to the delay through the first latch, it can grab this prior value of D1 and go into a hold before this one can go from hold back to track and, and update what this interim signal D1 was with data. So that's how you're able to like hold that value while it transitioned from this one going from track to hold and this one going from hold to track. So now at this point, this second D latch is in hold mode and this first one went into track mode. So now D1 is being updated again. So you can see that D1 is now moving around. And now at this point, this is the situation where here comes the next latch. And in this case, let's say that D1 was at a one. And you say, well, how did you grab it? Well, the first D latch goes into hold mode and it grabs it quickly. And now D1 is locked in. And then this one over here, the second D latch goes into track mode and it simply passes it through. So that's the behavior of a D flip flop using this master slave configuration where you have two D latches that one is open, one is closed, one is in track, the other one is hold and vice versa. Okay? So that is, that is the theory of operation of a D latch.
or excuse me, a D flip-flop. And it turns out that th those are the most popular storage devices in digital systems today because they are edge sensitive and they're very quick. So we have one more consideration to think about and that is how do you know the start value of the D flip-flop? Well, it turns out that you can put a reset line on the D flip-flop and you can also put a preset line. So there's ways to wire in and manually set or clear the outputs. So you have a reset line on them, and when you assert the reset line, it will drive Q to a zero. Now, the way that the flip-flops are built, it turns out that the most common way to do it is with an active low reset, so you put an inversion bubble on it. But the way that this works is the reset is asynchronous, meaning that it is the highest priority signal in the system. So it will blow, it doesn't care what clock's doing, it doesn't care what D is doing. If you assert reset, it will take Q to a zero and QN to a one. And that's how you put the starting value of the D flip-flop. So to synchronize everything in a system to the clock, you, you reset all the D flip-flops, get them to known values, then you provide the same clock to everything, and then everything starts running and is updated on the rising edge of the clock. So the truth table for this looks like reset is the top dog, it's the priority. So it drives Q to a zero and QN to a one. And then when it's a one, the D flip-flop goes into normal operation mode. A preset line is the way that you would get Q to go to the other value, which would be one. And presets and resets, they typically are active low also. So a preset would set Q, reset would clear Q, okay? Another thing you can do with a D flip-flop is you can put an enable on it. And an enable will, reset is still the top priority signal and then clock will always be running, but you have to have enable asserted in order for Q to be updated. So in this situation, this is a way to get a synchronous system. So you have an enable, which is synchronous, meaning that the clock will, on a rising edge of a clock, the way the D flip-flop will work is it will make sure that enable is asserted. If it is, it will update Q with D. If it is not asserted, it will just hold the prior value of a D, of the prior value of D. And then, Finally, that leads us to the real power of the D flip-flop, and that is in building synchronous systems, okay? So this is how we finally get back full circle and look at how you build a sequential logic circuit. If you think about a sequential logic circuit, it's going to make a decision on the output based upon current inputs and past values of the inputs. Well, how do you get the past values of an input? Well, you do it with the D flip-flop. So the inputs came in and they did something. They, their values dictated some value that went into the D flip-flop. You clocked it, latched it. Since this Q is only updated on the rising edge of a clock, it can be fed back into the combinational logic circuit that produces what the D input was. And you have time enough, if you have the edges of the clock far enough apart, you have time for this to be fed back and it can now be considered in the decision of what the next input to the D flip-flop is going to be. So if you build a system like this, this is how you get access to the past values. So this is the output, but it also represents a history of all the inputs that have led up to its current value. And then the way that you build a synchronous system is you have all these D flip-flops which are all tied to the same clock and they're all triggered on the rising edge of that clock. So all the events happen on that very fine, precise timing event, which is the rising edge of a clock, and then they all update their outputs. All the outputs are then fed back into a, a bunch of combinational logic circuits, which then trickle through and produce whatever the next input to the D of all the D flip-flops is going to be. So that's how you use the D flip-flop to ultimately build a synchronous digital system.